Eve, and when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching, and said, By what authority dost thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? So they're, they're asking Christ, hey, how, how are you able to do this? Who are you to come in here and teach in our temple? They're talking to the Son of God here. They're looking for man's credentials. You know what? Many times true teachers of God's word don't have long lists of men's credentials. It's just never been that way. Verse 24, And Jesus answered and said unto them, said unto them, I will ask you uh, one thing, which if you tell me, I will likewise tell you by what authority I do these things. Verse 25, The baptism of John. Whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did you not believe then? Or why did you not then believe him? But if you shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. You see these schemers here? They're always trying to figure out the next move. Oh, if he says this, if, if we say this, he's going to say this, and, and so forth. Verse 27, And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you, by what authority I do these things. You know, I love how Christ always uh, always outsmarted the Kenites. He always outsmarted them. Verse 28, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. Now this is Christ giving a special parable, and this is one you need to pay close attention to. Because it'll give you a little bit more in-depth information about uh, who's in charge of the Zionist movement today. Verse 29, And he answered and said, I will not, but afterward he repented and went. Okay, so the first, the first son said, Hey, I, I, you know, I don't want to go work today. Dad, I'm just not going to. And then after he thought about it, yeah, I better listen to my father. And he went out and worked. But then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm really religious. I'm going to go right out and work for you. But they didn't. 31, whether of them twain, or which one of them did the will of his father? They say unto him, the first. Now check this out. Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go in unto the kingdom of God before you. Now, could you imagine how they must be feeling at this time? They think they're so righteous, so holy, and Jesus just told them, Hey, the harlots and the common person, the tax collector, is going to make it into heaven way before you do. You know, and we look out at many of our so-called religious uh, hierarchy or community today. And the same message still applies. It still applies. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And when he had seen it, repented not afterward that you might... And, and when you had seen it, you repented not afterward that you might believe him. Here is a special parable here. Um, well, we're just going to begin. 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. Now these husbandmen would be those who were supposed to tend the vineyard. And when we're looking at this in the symbolic sense that Christ is trying to explain to us. We're looking out at a nation that was supposed to be entrusted into certain people's hands. Verse 34, And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen 
that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent out other servants more than the first, and they did unto him likewise. Now what's going on? Why are these guys beating up all these people whom the master sent? These are the uh, servants, the prophets. And we know from, um, uh, it was a John chapter 8, it might be. Maybe it's Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 23, I believe it is, where Christ said to those who claimed to be Jews at that time, he said, you're not, you're not, uh, well, he, he told them in many places, you're not really of Abraham's seed because if you were truly of Abraham, you would do the deeds of Abraham, but you do the deeds of your father, the devil. And he told them that they killed all the prophets, all the way back from the beginning, all the way until the end of time. And he said that it was their family seed or genealogy that were responsible for that. And this parable ties in with that one as well. Check this out. So he sent all these other servants. Verse, uh, they beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. Okay, these guys were, these guys were vicious. Anytime God sent somebody to come there and help them, these jokers came there to try to stop the truth. They are no different today. No different. But the last of all, he sent, to, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. Surely they'll reverence my son if I send my only begotten son. Verse 28, But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, Now keep in mind, these husbandmen represent the Jewish leadership of the day. Those who practice Judaism. And he said among them, and they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. My friend, that is what this is all about. Because these husbandmen worship a false Christ, and they believe that if they killed our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because he was the heir, that they could steal the inheritance. And they have stolen the inheritance of our people today because they claim to be Israelites. But they are not. They're liars. As Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9 states, when the majority of the true Israelites today uh, are actually made up or actually make up the Christian nations of the world. And yet here's this small group of imposters over there today demanding that we um, follow them and worship at their feet. Because after all, they say, hey, we gave you one of our sons, uh, you know, uh, that is your Messiah. But you know what? Jesus Christ isn't related to them one bit. Not even one bit.
Come, let us kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. That's what it was all about. That's why they had Christ crucified. 39, and they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. And when the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? What do you think he's going to do unto them? They say unto him, you know, keep in mind, they don't understand that he's referring to them at, at this point. They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. They just condemn themselves. Verse 42, for Jesus, Jesus saith unto them, did you never read in the scriptures? You know, oftentimes Jesus would say that. Did you never read? Have you never read? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. In other words, Christ was the stone. They were supposedly the builders of the nation. But they rejected that chief cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. That 43, therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God. Now check this out. For those Christians who believe that those who claim to be Jews truly are of the tribe of Judah, if they really believe that all of them are, which they not all are, there's only a small percentage of them that truly are, even if they believe that, they still couldn't reconcile with this verse. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And you know what Christ was referring to? He was referring to those ten lost tribes. And you'll even talk, he'll even talk about it in John chapter 10. Where he says, My sheep hear my voice. And he was, and he was referring to his sheep that had scattered north into Europe who were later renamed Caucasians. They spread throughout Europe, building Christian nations and kingdoms, spreading the gospel of the kingdom, and then later crossed the Atlantic Ocean to build the greatest Christian nation that has ever existed, America. The nation that has produced more fruit than any other nation in the history of the world in regards to Christianity, freedom, Liberty, you name it. And yet, we have Christians today in this nation who say that if we do not uh, stand up for the modern day Israeli nation, that that's the end of America. That is nothing but out and out folly, and it's even blasphemous. Because of what Jesus Christ said in Revelations 2, 9 and 3, 9. Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. That he knows the blasphemy of those who claim to be Jews or of our, of the, of our brother Judah. And they do lie. But are of the synagogue, synagogue of Satan. Think about that. What does he say here, verse 44? In other words, Christ said, hey, I'm taking this kingdom. You're not producing fruit. I'm going to give it to the nation that really is. And all the while, Christ knew that this leadership was a bunch of imposters anyways. Again, because of John 8, 44. And Matthew chapter 13, as well as Matthew 23, and many other places. Verse 45, and when the chief... Oh, I'm sorry, verse 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken... But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. In other words, what Christ is saying, hey, you rejected this stone. But there's a day coming that that stone is going to fall upon their head and grind them to powder. I suppose we could call Jesus, we could call him an anti-Semite here, couldn't we? You know, because that's what people say anytime we point out 
the things that the Zionist movement does today. They, they try to label people as anti-Semite. When those people, when many of those people who are saying that are not even of Shem at all. Never descended from him. But were rather from the Khazarian kingdom. Verse 45, And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Now, then they finally figured it out. They finally figured it out. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. You know, in the upcoming series of studies, you might be thinking, you might be getting kind of excited as you're learning some of these things. And you're seeing how clear it was that Jesus Christ, um, how he pointed out these evil figs, this cursed fig tree. And how he said that, hey, I'm going to take this kingdom away from you and give it unto a, a nation that's producing fruit. These things make sense to you. Um, because it's there. It's in plain language. Although it isn't a parable, it is simple to understand. But in the coming weeks, we are going to actually cover, and this is important because, I must mention this, I feel that America is being set up at this time. Oh yeah, you know, many of our beloved Conservative Christian friends are yelling at us saying Israel's being set up and, you know, poor them, poor this. But I feel America's being set up. Because I know. Well, we're going to get into it in the coming, uh, coming weeks here. We're going, to, we're going to study the book of Esther. And the book of Esther will tell us. It'll expose the plots and plans of the enemies of Christianity and freedom. You might be thinking, what, what, I thought Esther was this big hero and so forth. What you need to do to understand the enemy's operations is to reverse the roles. Because our enemy has interwoven a plan to make Christians, to make Christians out to be Haman of that story. And it is so fascinating and it is so enlightening to understand that book. And I cannot wait to get into it. Um, but the next study we're going to do, and I must mention this as well. We're talking about this evil fig tree. One of the things that should give it away. And we even have a, I even have a source on it. Uh, it's a book called The Six-Pointed Star by a guy named Dr. Graham who was actually, um, who is actually of probably true Jewish descent of the tribe of Judah. And he points out in there how that, that six-pointed star it, is not a good symbol. And we cover that in our, in our uh, video titled Victory Over Evil. And you'll learn about that there. That symbol has sixes all over it. And if you can remember... We were told that to, to count the number of the beasts in Revelation 13, verse 18, and that it was a number of a man, and his number was 600, three score and six, or six, six, six. But um, yeah, we go into that a little bit there. But the next study we're going to do is going to be fascinating. It's titled, we're going to be Zionism part four, but it's going to be titled Mystery Babylon because it's a secret. It's a secret to most of the world because they have no idea what's going on. And in that study, we're going to cover some very interesting things that parallel back to um, the three sieges that Nebuchadnezzar laid upon Jerusalem. Back when the Israelites truly controlled Jerusalem. Uh, I should say the, the kingdom of Judah controlled Jerusalem. So don't miss any of these upcoming studies. We're going to cover more and more depth as we get into these things. And, um, and it's so exciting to be able to bring it to you. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. And we just pray that you can continue to give us eyes to see and ears to hear so that we can follow your truth and be able to help others who are lost in the confusion of this world. In Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.